hey, Matt, uh, by any chance, did you see this week uh, South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster uh, giving a statement saying that he will take actions to invalidate uh, HR one, if it is passed, as it is a uh, an invalidation of the sovereign, the constitutional so- sovereignty of uh, South Carolina. Wait a minute, are you saying that he's going to nullify a federal law in South Carolina? Yes, I know this isn't a current events podcast, and this will kind of date our recording. But seeing as just last week we were going over the uh, Jackson Van Buren era and the nullification crisis, I couldn't help but uh, crack a smile and kind of put my heads in my hand as I saw the governor of South Carolina going up and saying, hey, now, uh, South Carolina has state sovereignty that is proven by the Constitution and just going, bitch, we already discussed this. And no, you do not. Well, we'll see. We we, they they tried to settle it, uh, but they left that pesky Constitution in place with all of its federalism and all of its uh, magic eye poster interpretability. (laughs) So we get to deal with this forever. Um, I would like to try to see them redo uh, something like Fort Sumter, where it's like the South Carolina Highway Patrol versus an aircraft carrier. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd like to see that, certainly. I mean, they've got a lot of military bases there, too. Who, who knows? Maybe they'll take them over. Well, we'll see. Uh, keeping our eyes on you, Governor Henry McMaster. Welcome to Hell of Presidents with Chris Wade and Matt Chrisman. This is episode four, The Lake of Shit. This takes us from the 1840s through the 1850s, a time of presidential instability and turmoil. So do you want to get into it, Matt? Oh, yeah, let's go. By the 1840s, the city of Washington, D.C. was beginning to resemble its current state of aseptic neoclassical majesty. On top of its neatly laid out diagonal boulevards, often compared apocryphally as sacred Masonic symbols, federal buildings of gleaming white marble arose. The Treasury Building, with its stately columns, began construction in 1836. Though it still lacked its iconic dome, the Capitol had been reconstructed from its burning in 1814 and sat stately upon Capitol Hill. By 1854, the first 152-foot nub of the Washington Monument had been erected. Everywhere, marble columns and promenades evoked Athenian agora. Down Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House looked much similar as today, minus the east and west wing, a stately and solemn manifestation of noble executive authority. And then, just blocks from the president's house, was the lake of shit. One thing D.C. lacked in the middle of the 19th century was a sewer system. Human waste collected in the streets and fed into the groundwater where most of the city still received its water supply. The White House's water supply itself was just a few blocks downstream from a collecting pond of, quote, night soil, a lovely 19th century euphemism for human shit collected from outhouses and various other depositories. For this entire period, the President of the United States was drinking the doo-doo water. Can, can I get some water? This is probably the best explanation of why, from 1840 to 1853, three out of the five presidents would die either in office or immediately after their term. William Henry Harrison notoriously died one month into his term. James K. Polk ate it three months after leaving office. Zachary Taylor clocked out about a year into his term. Though the given causes of death varied, Harrison got too chilly at his inaugural speech, as the legend goes, or Taylor got a fatal tummy ache from eating too much cherries and cream, the deaths were almost certainly caused, at least in part, from literally eating shit as U.S. president. This period of one-term wonders was marked by the domination of the Whigs as a national party, but even as they literally ate shit in the White House, these presidents were also eating shit of the single intractable issue that came to be the center of every debate. Slavery. This era is defined by a series of increasingly hostile compromises around the issue of expanding slavery into new territories. As each president attempted to resolve the balance of power in their favor, the underlying contradictions became deeper and more intractable. But hey, we can always punt the issue off on the next guy. It's not like this is going to result in some cataclysmic rupture of sectional violence, right, Matt? Of course not. You'd be that'd be ridiculous. Everybody wants the union to be together. Nobody thinks this is worth fighting about, right? And that's what everybody thinks until the very end of the conflict because 
uh, the political uh, class is is in the back seat during this period as the uh, northern uh, industrial economy comes into self expression and as southern pl- cotton agriculture explodes uh, as the, the most profitable segment of the American economy and that creates a conflict over the continent over what the institutions and political economy would be in the places that were being brought into uh, the United States through westward expansion, driven by this economic dynamo and all of the political conflict created by this new shifting economy. You see the first emergence of working class uh, political expression uh, during this period. You see a huge explosion in religious fervor, a third great awakening. You see uh, uh, quantum leaps forward in communication and uh, transportation technology. And all of it leads to a situation where the fundamental conflict at the heart of the American project goes from something that was a peripheral political debate uh, in the 1820s to something that is by uh, the 1850s, the only thing anyone really cares about. This episode ends on the presidency of Millard Fillmore, which I think is who is usually considered one of the, uh, I don't know, joke presidents because, you know, he's like the paragon of randos from the 19th he's, century. And especially he has that goofy name. He's the Mallard yeah. Fillmore. The only president with two matching consonants in both his first and last name. And that's inherently funny, you know? Yeah. And apparently he was for a long time. The only thing, the only fact anyone knew about um, Fillmore was that he had the first toilet installed in the White House. But apparently that was a a joke from a Mark Twain column or something. (laughs) And uh, that wasn't even true. And now I think people, if they know him at all, know him as the uh, inspiration for a certain, a certain uh, irreverent cartoon duck that you might find in the funny pages. Exactly. But we decided to end this episode on him because he is of these guys kind of the best viewpoint character because as we'll get into later in the episode, his political evolution over this 20 to 30 year chunk in the middle of the 19th century kind of perfectly tracks with the arc of the Northern Whig yeah. from their evolution to their uh, consolidation as a uh, dominant political party to their eventual dissolution and where their tendencies go afterwards. Yes, it's the it's the Whig. Millard Mil- Mil- represents the Whig party stripped of its moral uh, pretenses. Because Millard Fillmore never gives a shit about slavery. He is always interested through his entire career in uh, allowing slavery to exist so that uh, northern uh, industry can be uh, allowed to expand. Uh, and and he, was, uh, he spent his entire career trying to find a political vehicle uh, for that point of view. And as time went on, it got harder and harder because more and more people in the north uh, cared about slavery, uh, demanded uh, the confrontation of slavery to be a key political demand. And uh, guys like Fillmore were uh, left frantically trying to figure out an alternative uh, way to get uh, Northerners to oppose the Democratic Party. Uh, and in his case, he comes along with the idea of uh, anti-Catholic nativism. <laughs> so we will get to Fillmore and his whole arc by the end of this episode. Uh, the central irony being a guy who's driven by a political ideology that essentially is slavery agnostic. By the time he gets in the driver's seat, his entire term is defined by slavery to such an extent that he is presiding over the Senate where people are li- senators are literally threatening to kill each other over it. But first, to get there, we have to start with perhaps the ultimate loser of the U.S. presidents, William Henry Harrison. I like to think of William Henry Harrison as our gag president. It's just funny to me that he is like the one when you're learning in school. It's like, yeah, you don't really know about have to know about this guy. He died one month into office. And I think every national history needs a figure like that, a, a whoopsie leader. Yeah, somebody who just uh, is there f- uh, to do a pratfall, essentially. Yeah. He essentially basically. came on stage for his inaugural, slipped on a banana peel, <laughs> fell into the sewer canal and died. Yes. Uh, It's also funny to me that he's the one my grandfather would always tell me our family was related to, 
which I'm certain isn't true or is true only in the vague sense that everyone whose family has lived in a certain area uh, for like a century is probably the 12th cousins with basically everybody else there. Uh, but it is just like a perfect middle class 20th, 20th century Ohio guy uh, brag of like, who's the president? Nobody will check this claim against uh, William Henry Harrison. Yeah, sure. Go with that. He, uh, he's your great, great, great grandfather or something. Harrison was born on February 9th, 1773. The youngest child of Benjamin Harrison, a founding father and wealthy Virginia planter, he made his name as governor of the Indiana Territory and especially as the hero of the war against the Native American leader Tecumseh, specifically at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811. Now, we're not going to spend too much time on Harrison because obviously he kicks it immediately and we covered his election last episode, uh, but let's just use him to get to Whig Party victory and John Tyler. As we went over last episode, the fledgling Whig Party pick Harrison as their guy in 1840, successfully latching what was a party of financiers and growing middle class to a guy who could at least project himself as being a brave military leader of rugged frontier virtue. This election saw the most wild campaigning the nation had seen yet, full of goofy spectacle. Uh, Harrison supporters in Cleveland made a giant ball of tin that they'd roll around from town to town chanting, What has caused this great commotion? Motion, motion. Our country through. It is the ball a rolling on for Tippecanoe and Tyler too. For Tippecanoe and Tyler too. For Tippecanoe and Tyler too. And with them will be little Van Van. Uh, other supporters handed out whiskey in log cabin shaped bottles made by the EC booze distillery. So thank you to William Henry Harrison for both the phrase, keep the ball rolling and booze. We certainly love our booze. So thank you, William Henry Harrison. But what about, and Tyler too, John Tyler was born in 1790 to a family of Virginian slave owners. Tyler came up as a U.S. representative from Virginia, the governor of Virginia, and then a U.S. senator from Virginia. As senator, though a Democrat, Tyler was often at odds with the Jackson administration, often over the issue of states' rights. He eventually permanently broke with the Democrats, siding against Jackson's force bill during the nullification crisis, and with the Whigs against Jackson's dissolution of the Bank of the United States. For this, the Whigs voted Tyler president pro tempore of the Senate, as a bit of a symbolic support. So, Tyler had come to be associated with the Whigs, though not officially won by the time of the 1840 election. As Henry Clay refused the VP spot, the position would shortly go from and Tyler too, to just Tyler. Matt, how did John Tyler end up on the ticket? It's because of the one of the big perils of a new party that is trying to define itself out of opposition to an existing party. The Whigs emerged as uh, a, the uh, unorganized uh, opposition to this new political thesis of Jacksonian democracy. Uh, and so it scrambled into being, and it was headquartered in the North among uh, uh, pro-bank, pro-tariff uh, industri- merchants and, and pr- fledgling industrialists. Uh, and so the challenge of those early uh, Whigs was to extend their uh, appeal beyond a section because if they couldn't, they wouldn't really be a viable national force to oppose the democracy. And so they looked wherever they could find for Southern support. But most of the uh, most prominent Southern opponents of, uh, of Jacksonianism, such as John Tyler uh, and uh, John C. Calhoun, who became an early Whig too before leaving the party again, before leaving the party, uh, were mostly opposed to Jackson on the issue of nullification, which was wrapped up in their entire uh, agricultural uh, planter economy worldview, which was directly in conflict uh, over many key questions with the the northern uh, uh, industrial policy. But the, the the party wanted to be nationally viable, so as a as a gesture towards Southerners uh, and Southern opposition to the Democrats, they get Tyler on the ballot, which uh, that's not a problem unless our old as hell uh, presidential candidate keels over. And then when he did, uh, it was quickly revealed that, uh, oh no, Tyler actually has all of the opinions on all of the major issues of our enemies. 
And even though we were able to, for the first time, seize control of House and the Senate, <laughs> uh, we now have someone even who was elected under our banner uh, in the White House opposing our policies. And so William Henry Harrison is sworn in March 4th, 1841, and fucking dies and is dead on April 4th, 1841. Rip William Henry Harrison, so long and thanks for all the booze. So long and thanks for all the fish. So that was the closest Henry Clay really did ever come to the White House, is if he had said yes to the VP spot there. That was, uh, that was his biggest bungle, for sure. In a career marked by both great triumphs of ideology and then bungles of practicality. Mm -hmm. John Tyler was sworn into office two days later on April 6th, 1841. So, as you were just laying out, we end up with this ironic situation. The newly organized Whig party has won the presidency with an arguably anti-Whig, pro-slavery, pro-states' rights president holding the office. Let's see how this plays out. So I'm just going to go through some issues here and see how they play out with President Tyler facing off against the boy, Henry Clay. Uh, maybe we can do a bit of a lightning round, Matt. All right. The bank. We're still arguing about the dang bank. Congressional Whigs won a recharter. What was Tyler's position? Eh, wrong. <laughs> Veto. No charter for you. Tariffs. Let's not forget, we're five years into the Panic of 1837, and now the Compromise Tariff of 1833 is up for renewal. Congressional Whigs want to raise tariffs. What was Tyler's position? Eh, wrong. Lower tariffs, motherfucker. Suck it. <laughs> and now let's get to the big boy, Texas. The one place you're not supposed to mess with. But we're messing with it for the next, like, decade or so. Matt, what's the deal with the Lone Star Republic? So Texas was a, pro a part of Mexico, uh, but it was very, very sparsely uh, populated relative to the rest of the country. And uh, over the early 19th century, it became filled up with Anglo settlers uh, from America who brought with them uh, their attitudes towards government, their belief in, in democracy, and their slaves. Uh, and in order, largely, frankly, to protect their ability to maintain slavery in, in Mexico, where slavery was being abolished, they uh, declared independence. Uh, were able to fight for that independence after remembering the Alamo and whatnot, uh, and in uh, 1836 became an independent country. Now, very quickly, uh, the people within the people at the in the top of the Texas political leadership moved to be annexed by the United States. They knew that this was all part of the Greater American Project. They wanted to uh, tag in with the mother country, and Southern interests were incredibly uh, uh, excited about this because they imagined bringing in a huge new territory for slavery to be extended into. Uh, but at first, it was a very politically tender subject because while the South wanted it, uh, Northerners were uh, not very enthused at all. They were worried about getting into a border conflict with Mexico, and they were worried about uh, the influence of slavery in the government being increased. Uh, and so... Both Jackson and Van Buren during their presidencies kind of tactfully avoided talking about Texas uh, out of uh, a desire to see uh, the sectional tensions not inflamed. But then Tyler gets in there and Tyler at this point is fully aware that he's not getting another term as the Whig uh, nominee for president. Uh, but it's also unlikely that he could run with the Democrats. His uh, vision was that he was going to get a real term on his own by creating a third party based specifically and explicitly around uh, the interests of slavery uh, and that that party would be able to so thoroughly dominate the politics of the South that it would be able to win a three-way race for uh, the, the presidency. And so he, Tyler takes Texas as his issue with which to do that and immediately begins pressing for the United States to officially annex Texas and spends the entirety of his term in office negotiating a treaty with the uh, technically uh, independent country of Texas to bring them in to the United States. Tyler's placing Texas annexation at the center of his bid for re-election. By 1842, Tyler had incurred enough of a break with the Whig Party that an amendment was introduced to impeach him. So, 
as you were saying, Tyler looked south, getting the idea that he might be able to create a new party orientation of Southern Democrats around him, mainly by flogging the Texas issue as an attempt to excite pro-expansionist slave powers. We head into the election of 1844 with this weird arrangement. The actual president has no party. The Whigs who got him into the presidency nominate his congressional antagonist, Henry Clay. Clay, going back for another bite at the apple. Too late, dude. You blew it. (laughs) The Democrats he's cozying up to or trying to subvert uh, turn back to the Red Fox, Martin Van Buren. But little do they know, they're all about to get polked. James Knox Polk was born on November 2nd, 1795 in Pineville, North Carolina. His parents were farmers of modest means, those slaveholders. And in 1806, the family relocated to Tennessee. James was educated at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and was admitted to the Tennessee Bar in 1820. His first case was actually defending his own father against a public fighting charge, uh, which I find very funny. And he secured his old old Sam Polk's release for a $1 fine. So uh, his dad was a fighting man. Uh, Polk became a member of the Tennessee House of Representatives in 1823. His speeches at the time gave him the nickname the Napoleon of the Stump. During his time in Tennessee government, he moved increasingly into the orbit of Andrew Jackson, so much that he would also become known as Young Hickory. Polk became U.S. Congressman from Tennessee's 6th in 1825. He would go on to be the House Ways and Means Chair and eventually Speaker of the House before returning to Tennessee and being elected governor in 1839. However, Polk was defeated in both 1841 and 1843 by a Whig opponent named James, quote, Lean Jimmy Jones. And can you ask for a better 19th century frontier congressman name than Lean Jimmy Jones? Uh, I, his, he has the best heart attack. If you, oh my God, here in the frozen <laughs> uh, vittles section of your local supermarket, the Lean Jimmy uh, Jones heart attack is to die for. His pemmican <laughs> beyond the, out of the world. Polk was left with an uncertain political future by the time the election of 1844 rolled around. So with Tyler out of the party, the Whigs easily nominated Henry Clay for president. The Democratic nomination was much trickier. Uh, Matt, can you run us through how James K. Polk became the first dark horse presidential nominee? So going into the convention uh, in 1844, uh, Martin Van Buren, the previous president and still one of the brains of the democratic party the guy who literally invented it uh is the clear front runner to get nominated to to go back and get his damn job back and (laughs) but that uh position starts to decay towards as the convention approaches because the question of texas annexation becomes more and more uh central in politics opposition to texas uh annexation uh grows in the north states like new york where uh Van Buren lived and certainly in uh, New England were becoming more and more hostile to the idea of absorbing Texas. And when the question is finally put to Van Buren, what his position on Texas annexation is as a guy who might be running for president again uh, and he can no longer uh, punt, he finally comes out with a statement opposing Texas annexation uh, Mm. because he thought it could not be sold in the North. But uh, the Southern Democrats were so in unison and uh, emphatic on the question of Texas that it made Van Buren no longer uh, uh, acceptable to them. And so even though Van Buren went into the convention with the most votes, a majority of votes, he was not able to secure on the first ballot the two-thirds majority that was required by uh, the party rules that had been, that had been agreed to. And he's his opponents at the first ballots are a collection of a different Southerners because the uh, opposition is is diffused. So people are voting for John C. Calhoun. They're voting for uh, Northerner, but pro-slavery Northerner, uh, Lewis Cass. They're voting for James Buchanan, uh, but they have not organized around a single candidate. Uh, eventually, uh, Van Buren, seeing that he can't win, tries to get the convention to agree to nominate his protege, Senator Silas Wright of New York. But Wright, who was trying his damnedest to get Van Buren nominated, comes forward and says that he doesn't accept and that he agrees with Van Buren on Texas annexation anyway, so you can suck me. Uh, and <laughs> with that uh, that impasse, uh, someone brings up the idea of Jimmy Polk, who had come into the convention hoping to be Martin Van Buren's running mate, 
uh, and had been a Van Buren ally, but was most closely associated with the old hero Andrew Jackson as a figure who could be agreeable across the sides. Uh, and finally, on the ninth ballot, uh, uh, Van Buren withdraws and Polk won. Out of nowhere. Yeah, it's it's kind of remarkable, especially given his immediate political past of being a two-time defeated gubernatorial candidate in Tennessee. Yeah. I mean, it really shows how uh, when these parties get into points of uh, critical crisis, they often paper over it with appeals to the past and appeals to uh, existing models. Uh, can't figure out a nominee. How about the guy they call Young Hickory? <laughs> he's like the he's like the mini me version of our beloved General Jackson. He is exactly like you in every way, except one eighth your size. Hey, I'm tired. It's 120 degrees in here. Uh, I'm wearing <laughs> we powder. We balloted 200 times. Uh, whatever. Uh, let's just let's get it over with. So the Democrats accede to supporting Texas annexation by nominating Polk carrying a basically straightforward Jackson Van Burenite platform aside from being pro annexation of Texas and Oregon. Polk's expansionist views reflected the dual needs for new territory that it not only would accede to the Southern slave owner expansionism, but expand the idea of democratic Liberty space for settlement and independent farmers. So they would not be pressured into wage labor. Yes. We're ringing that bell this week for it's free, real it's free real estate. It's free real estate. It's free. Real Estate. It's always the free real estate. Uh, though there were dissenting voices within the party, uh, Theodore Sedgwick III wrote Polk was a, quote, rascally fraud, a complete surrender by the majority to the slaveholding minority. He is also, I might say, add, uh, I think our only president to ever sport a mullet while in office. <laughs> Throughout this entire period of the 40s, you know, we were talking about great names in the 1830s. This is a period of uh, great presidential hair. Oh, names. my God. Spectacular hair. You got the mutton shops on MVB. You've got yeah. the towering cough of Daniel Webster and uh, also James Buchan or uh, John C. Calhoun. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got uh, just that beautiful mullet, beautiful grace mullet on uh, Polk. I was looking at uh, Zachary Taylor, too, and he's, he's kind of got a, a, a rather rakish uh, mop head going, even though he's, he, look, he looks like he's wearing like a 20 year old model's hair on like a 60 year old uh, 19th century guy's body. He was he was a he was a fox. Yeah, he was honky. John Tyler, still the president and theoretically Democratic aligned, uh, stumbled along in the race, still thinking that he's going to build the Southern Democratic slaveholder constituency until the summer. And then he uh, kind of unceremoniously dropped out. Yeah, it's like as always happens with these guys. This happens again and again. And there's the other the party that you just helped by obstructing their opponent for four years just says, thank you very much. But uh, we don't trust snitches. <laughs> and then they nominate one of their own because why do they need you? They got Polk and Polk's got the same position on Texas that you do. And so it goes. Wigs with clay against annexation and Dems with Polk for into the general. The race is extremely tight and ends up revolving around both parties attempting to turn out and win constituents on the margin, which is why it's a good time to talk about the new Liberty Party and James Birney. Matt? Okay, so this period in American history is when you first, when you finally see uh, abolitionism, anti-slavery sentiment uh, becoming a active force in American politics. Before this, anti-slavery sentiment exists in the most uh, refined and genteel middle-class homes of the America's northern cities, uh, uh, as early as, as the founding, you have anti-slavery sentiment. But uh, it's mostly a crank thing uh, by uh, weirdos. Uh, and it was something that the, the majority of people at the center of politics in both parties really wanted to avoid talking about because it got in the way of the stuff they really actually cared about, which was the, the, the fight over political power and the application of political power, which all necessitated uh, everyone agreeing that we actually have one country in this party and they didn't like people running around uh, reminding everybody that actually there's two countries and you're going to have to do something about that at one point. Uh, but as slavery expands and as the cotton empire of the South explodes in influence and power and uh, profit and political articulation, uh, there is a movement that grows in kind in the North among the middle class, largely, uh, 
of people morally opposed to slavery and who want their politics to reflect that as a organizing principle. And that movement comes into being during this period and almost immediately splits into two factions. You've got the people organized around William Lloyd Garrison and his anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, who believe that the U.S. Constitution is a covenant with death and an agreement with hell, (laughs) and that the entire United States government is irredeemably tainted by its association with slavery. Slavery is a foundational element of the American government, and as such, should be opposed entirely. Uh, And then you have those who believe that the Constitution is actually an anti-slavery document, and that all the slavery stuff was uh, uh, an imposition on it that could be removed through the use of elections. Uh, If you can draw your own conclusions as to which I think was closer to uh, correct in their uh, analysis of the Constitution. (laughs) Um, But the the tactical question of what to do about it is a separate one. And many people thought we should be trying to gain power through the levels we have and exercise it there. And that movement at first was very small. I mean, this is like Green Party style politics. This is middle class, moralistic, third party politics, hobby politics, basically. Uh, and so by 1840, the uh, M- Liberty Party is able to run uh, James Burney, a southern former slave owner who had come to be horrified by slavery and become an abolitionist as their candidate. They only got 0.2 percent of the vote. Uh, but two things are consequential about that. One, that was the margin between Polk and Clay in New York, which had decided the election and which, if it had gone differently, would have put Clay in the White House and maybe have stopped the annexation of Texas uh, and really changed the course of the sectional conflict. Uh, and also that the other thing of note is that that nascent uh, presidential anti-slavery politics is going to grow in leaps and bounds uh, over the coming years as the sectional crisis intensifies. And you're going to see um, uh, the Free Soil Party come out of that. Uh, and then later, the Republican Party, which will, before anybody has any idea what's happening, seize power of the federal government. Yeah. And I think for, for me, it's important to put a distinction on, you know, the abolitionism as a distinct phenomenon from bit vague anti-slavery uh, issues. Because you could argue that, you know, Jefferson sometimes claimed he was right, anti-slavery. Yeah, the whole, I think they would, all the fucking... Uh, uh, the entire founding generation, if you polled them, would be anti-slavery in the sense that they assumed it was all going to go away. Yeah, that's because what I Because they thought that its only economic uh, utility was to provide like libraries and, and wine cellars for some hob- po- hobbyist politicians in the rapidly depleting uh, Virginia Piedmont doing tobacco farming. They had no idea what cotton agriculture would become in this country. So this is the distinct movement that is proactively seeking a political cessation uh, a prohibition of slavery versus the general sentiment that, hey, maybe it'll go yes. away eventually. Opposing slavery as a matter of policy. So arguably due to the Bernie spoiler. <laughs> the Bernie? Bernie bros. <laughs> those those Bernie bros. Uh, so arguably due to the Bernie spoiler, uh, Polk narrowly wins the election of 1844. John Tyler, his accidency, owned. as his opponents called him, is owned. And doubly so as ironically... Tyler and Calhoun are able to push through a compromised Texas annexation plan just six days before the swearing in of James K. Polk. So, you know, he kind of got it done, but he doesn't get any credit for it. Yeah. Uh, just like Andrew Johnson destroyed uh, Reconstruction or tried, did his best to do that. And uh, now nobody even remembers him. It's really his thankless work. Uh, well, we'll get to him next episode. James K. Polk pursued a singular will to expand U.S. territory. After some negotiation with the U.K., Polk secured the Oregon Territory south of the 49th 54, parallel. 40-year fight? Okay, never mind. The 49th parallel. 49, 49 fight. We were bluffing. Uh, yeah, well, you got you to gotta play. You got to you bid high. It's got to you know? be high. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we want that Yukon. Give it to us. Yeah, if fucking uh, Barack Obama had negotiated the fucking Webster-Ashburton Treaty, the fucking American border would be like, north of san francisco <laughs> uh so yeah oregon territory polk secured the Euro- oregon territory south of the 49th parallel for the u.s in 1845 also in december of 1845 polk signed the resolution officially annexing texas into the united states 
As Mexico had never formally recognized Texan independence, this exacerbated an already growing tension between the countries. Y'all know where this is heading. Mexican-American War. Matt, break down the Mexican-American War for us. So one of the big reasons that uh, many Northerners opposed Texas annexation is that they worried that it would lead to a border conflict with Mexico, which, what do you know, that's exactly what happened, which was the point. Uh, Everyone uh, who was pushing Texas annexation was also looking over across the border at at northern Mexico uh, and at California like a cartoon dog with a bib, (laughs) just slavering at it. At a a giant T-bone steak. Yes. Uh, And the Mexican army at that point seemed like it was uh, a gettable opponent. Uh, and so it looked like it was just the smart thing to do. So uh, immediately after the uh, annexation, or <clears throat> very shortly, uh, immediately in 19th century standards after the annexation, so in July of 1845, Polk sends 3,500 troops under Zachary Taylor uh, to the Nuensis Strip in uh, the disputed territory between Texas and Mexico and the Rio Grande, uh, and proceeds to spend the next uh, almost year uh, trying to provoke little Gulf of Tonkin uh, uh, incidents uh, and trying to get a enough of a violent response from the Mexican uh, military there that is also patrolling what they claim what they believe to be their territory uh, that you could justify uh, a war which is exactly what finally happens Uh, there is an incident where Mexican troops fire on an American patrol and war were declared. Uh, (laughs) Now, during this period, young Abraham Lincoln is a freshman Whig congressman from Illinois, uh, and he gets up and he gives a speech where he asks to be shown the specific spot where the American blood had been uh, supposedly spilled to justify this war. Show me on the doll where the uh, Mexicans hurt you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Implying that it might it was a fiction or that even if it wasn't, it was one that most likely occurred in Mexican territory. Uh, he was promptly uh, thrown out of his seat in the next election. <laughs> uh, uh, Abe getting a little bit uh, too anti-war there during a period when uh, the Mexican War, which started off sluggishly and uh, went took longer than I think many Americans were expecting, and was uh, more produced more casualties. It was, though, successful. There was a two prong attack in, from northern and uh, into northern and southern Mexico. Uh, Winfield Scott triumphantly marches U.S. troops into Mexico City. Uh, there is a treaty with Mexico called Guadalupe Hidalgo, where the where Mexico agrees to uh, cede in exchange for you know a, a, some cash and the player to be named later. Uh, the Northern Territories, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, which is having its own uh, independence movement at the same time, which the United States then uh, uses as uh, a leverage to seize it as well. And this reads the question immediately after the uh, victory, what are we going to do with this land? What labor system will dominate in the territory we've just acquired? Right which will become the defining feature of the rest of the 1840s. Yep. So after a long negotiation, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed on February 2nd, 1848, obtaining Mexican territorial concessions of all of modern California, Nevada, Utah, most of Arizona, parts of Colorado, and New Mexico. And yet some in Polk's cabinet urged its rejection because they wanted more territory. Uh, Polk's term would establish basically, minus the uh, pesky Gadsden Purchase, the current territorial boundaries of the modern continental United States. And just, it's really a marvel that they really only took like 60 years to seal the deal on Manifest Destiny. Sea to Shining Sea and 11 presidencies. On that grind. So Polk had succeeded rather wildly in reforming the Democratic Party into an expansionist machine. But on the domestic front, he welded this expansionism to a classic Democrat fixation. That's right, folks. We're back to talking about the dang bank, or more specifically, the independent treasury. Matt, Martin Van Buren had tried sta- to stand this thing up, but Polk's the one who really gets it done. What's the deal with the treasury? 
So the independent treasury is the final attempt to end the political question of banking and monetary policy by by depoliticizing it. Uh, the, I mean, that's what everyone said they were doing. Uh, but what they were actually doing was mystifying the money supply. So until this period, you had had this ungangly system of the United States managing its uh, revenues by first putting them in a privately chartered bank of the United States, which would then lend money out to people and lend currency out above its reserves. Uh, and and this enraged the plain Jeffersonian uh, Republicans of the country against this usurpation of power by a private industry or by a private company and, and in alliance with government. And under Jackson, the bank was killed and replaced by a system of distribution to state banks called pet banks, which just was essentially a decentralized version of the bank system, but this time ar around banks that were friendly politically to the Democratic Party. Uh, and neither one of these solutions really solved the issue of the perception of the government being uh, untowardly involved in issuing currency. And the independent treasury was Van Buren's way to finally resolve this by creating an independent government bureau that would not be a bank, that would simply carry the government's revenues in gold in its vaults and then put out uh, currency that it corresponded to the amount of uh, specie that it held. And finally, make uh, take banking out of the government's purview. Uh, now, of course, we know that that's still a political act. This is still a politically uh, managed money supply. But thanks to the the yeoman mythology that was presiding over the country, uh, it was for many Democrats a satisfying way to have a paper currency and have banking without feeling that you were having your rights trampled upon. Uh, and Martin Van Buren was able to, after spending his entire term fighting to, to uh, get it over the finish line, gets a one-year one year chartering for an independent treasury. But then finally, uh, Polk is able to make it uh, permanent. And uh, not, not to get too big picture right in the middle of this, but I know that this was one of the, you know... Um, major themes that we wanted to get across in this that you, that you wanted to discuss is kind of this ongoing process at the federal level to remove certain hinge points, remove certain decisions from the political sphere. And that, that is one of the stories of a federal American federal government, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, the currency is an issue that goes from being the central point of political contest in the early Republic to one that is completely non-political now. And that is a process of abstraction away from politics, the levers of true power. Uh, and, and when you see the, the money supply in American history and the, the arguments about the banks and then the treasury, and then uh, after the Civil War, uh, the arguments about, about the gold standard and silver, and then finally the uh, creation of the um, Federal Reserve in 1916, a process of those questions being pushed to the margin uh, because of their, they were too fundamental to be left to democratic control by the, the actual beneficiaries of the system, the emerging capitalist class. Right, exactly. And so that's one of the, the, the money supply is one of those few issues that we will talk about, come back to over and over again uh, in the 20th century. Uh, that will also include things like foreign policy, which we will get to yeah. a few episodes from now. So Polk got it done. And the thing you learn about Polk, if you learn anything at all, is that he's one of the few guys, maybe the only one who came into office with a simple concrete agenda, executed it all in one term, and then left. And like, obviously, all these guys are monstrous. Polk was a pro-slavery expansion expansionist and ripped a bunch of, of land away from Mexico to support that vision. Uh, but in terms of his era, uh, I guess points for efficiency. Uh, especially for a guy who was a dark horse who wasn't really even supposed to be there in the first place. Polk doesn't seek a second term and leaves office on March 3rd, 1849. He took a short tour of the South on his way to Nashville, uh, but pretty much immediately got sick. 
he would be dead in his home in Nashville by June 15th at age 53. Supposedly of cholera, he contracted on a riverboat. Uh, I choose to believe that he is, in fact, another victim of the lake of shit. You can't prove it's not true. Co- I mean, it's cholera. They called all like intestinal diseases yeah. cholera then. His last words were supposedly to his wife, quote, I love you, Sarah, for all eternity. I love you, which I just included because, you know, ah, huh, sweet. This takes us uh, back a year from his death to the election of 1848. Zachary Taylor was the hero of the Mexican-American War. He defeated General Mariano Arista at Palo Alto and Reseca de la Palma, then Pedro de Ampudia at the Battle of Monterrey. Against the commands of his superiors, he had pushed his forces south into Mexico and crushed Santa Ana at the Battle of Buena Vista. He had returned from the campaign a national hero, a pimp, a chad, and as we'll discover, a bit of a himbo. Taylor was born to, oh, wait, well, I'm checking my notes. What's this shocker? A family of wealthy slaveholding planters in Virginia. What? I know, right? Can you believe it? Don't believe it. Uh, And just because I find this funny and interesting, let's do some family tree shit. He's descended of Mayflower pilgrims on one side, and through that line was second cousins with James Madison. He was third cousins with Robert E. Lee. One of his daughters would marry Jefferson Davis, though she died three months after the wedding. So, you know, he was in there in the, in the in the elite. But I also think it's just a good illustration that there were just not that many people in the Southern planter class. So everyone's someone's cousin. Yeah. If 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 they had been able to keep their power, just imagine how gloriously Habsburgianly inbred they would be by now. <laughs> every, uh, you know, every member of the Confederacy cabinet in 2021 would be named like Jonathan Jefferson Davis Lee. Hulk, you know, their eyes would be so close together. They'd be in the wrong sockets. <laughs> His family eventually moved out to Kentucky where he grew up. Taylor was a lifelong military guy serving in the war of 1812, uh, commanding a fort in Green Bay, Wisconsin, your area. Woo! He had that's he was the first cheese head <laughs> uh, serving in the Black Hawk War, the Second Seminole War, and generally traveling around imposing brutal U.S. military force to pacify various indigenous populations. And for his work, he was eventually promoted to Brigadier General. He also got a plantation going near Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So 1848 rolls around, and kind of everyone wants this guy. Uh, And that's where Zachary Taylor's whole himbo thing comes into play, because Taylor was not overtly political. He had never publicly declared any political beliefs, nor did he vote for president before himself in 1848. Uh, He could have credibly pitched himself as either a Democrat or a Whig, uh, but in the end, his views ended up aligning best with the Whigs. Lacking a strong candidate as the old warhorse Henry Clay declined to run, the Whigs chose Taylor and ran with him, adding Millard Fillmore, a New Yorker, for the traditional sectional balance. The 1848 election was marked by disunion. Both parties struggled to maintain national unity in the face of internal divisions. The Democrats had nominated Louis Cass for president, a northerner, the governor of Michigan, who was suspected of having pro-Southern slavery leanings, and William O. Butler for vice president, a Southern slave owner from Kentucky suspected of having abolitionist leanings. So you can see that within these parties struggling for coherency, uh, they're just being ripped apart by the internal contradictions of a whole national project at this point. Wouldn't you say, Matt? Yeah, the, the, uh, you're tearing me apart, Lisa. <laughs> you are tearing me apart, Lisa! Taylor wins an uninspiring victory in 1848, scraping by with 163 electoral votes to Cass's 127. Uh, if a few states had flipped either way, the whole thing could have gone differently. And, having been denied the Democratic Party nomination again, Van Buren is back, now running for the free soil ticket. And as we were talking about, the abolitionist movement is growing and growing uh, to the point that though Van Buren in 1848 didn't win any electoral votes, he did garner 10% of the popular vote, a major showing for the abolitionist movement. But Taylor gets it. A Whig president was now elected, providing a Democrat war. Zach Taylor, old rough and ready, as he was called, began his term in March 4th, 1849. He is immediately confronted with the issue of what the fuck do we do with all this land? Henry Clay and Daniel Webster are busy scrounging up a compromise in Congress. Taylor is meeting with Southern leaders threatening secession and to his credit tells them that persons, quote, 
Taken in rebellion against the Union would hang with less reluctance than he had hanged deserters and spies in Mexico. So shit is getting tense. And then, just as all of this is ratcheting up a notch, Zachary Taylor dies and is fucking dead. The official story is that he ate too many cold cherries and iced milk in the July 4th celebration, uh, but we know what happened. He died 15 months into taking residency in the White House of severe gastrointestinal distress, lake of shit. It was the lake of shit. Come on, folks. It's always open, the lake of shit. They're drinking, they're drinking the doo-doo water. They're drinking the doo-doo water. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, so Taylor is kaput, which brings us to Mallard Fillmore. Out of these 1840s guys, Millard Fillmore is really our spotlight, namely because his political career perfectly tracks with the development of the Northern Whig over the course of his life. Fillmore was born January 7th, 1800, the crack of the 19th century, into a poor family in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. He spent his adolescence working menial labor in the area and self-educating himself on whatever books he could find. Through various apprenticeships and intermittent schooling, he eventually learned law and was admitted to the New York State Bar in 1823, then set up a small practice in East Aurora, New York. He's a very uh, self-made bootstraps kind of guy. Uh, He got elected to the New York State Assembly, moved to Buffalo, and became a leading citizen there as it was developing as a major town, then was elected four times uh, as U.S. congressman. But this is where we should really start tracking his political evolution. Okay, so the thing to know about Fillmore, the thing that defines his politics, is where he builds his practice and his uh, reputation as a local citizen of note. Uh, Buffalo, New York which is the uh, terminus point of the Erie Canal. And the Erie Canal defined the politics and defined the economics of the region, Erie County that he lived in. And And that politics was, by its very nature, defined against the uh, Democratic Party, whose, which in its early days was largely... Uh, organized around hostility to the sort of internal improvements uh, represented by the canal. And so the the burgeoning middle class of this area, uh, which makes up the most prominent political section, is is primed to oppose uh, the Democratic Party. But how exactly it was going to do that was to, uh, had to be uh, figured out over time because the Whig Party, of course, does not just come out of nowhere. Uh, it comes out of a pro- the greater project of trying to stitch together opposition to the Democrats. So that takes us to a little guy named Thurlow Weed that we talked Thurlow about last Weed. week. Thurlow Weed! Who is a political fixer and editor. Those guys were the uh, kingpins of most political machines at that time because of their ability to get government printing contracts. Uh, and Thurlow Weed was the guy who had out maneuvered the red fox himself uh in 1848 to gain new york's uh electoral votes for john quincy adams and elect him but shortly after that it became clear to weed and pretty much everybody that john quincy adams was fucked uh (laughs) in new york uh in a rematch with jackson and that put guys like weed in a position to look for a, a, a way to uh help this situation and they found it with the William Morgan case. Uh, this was uh, in 1827, a man named William Morgan, uh, a former, uh, a self-proclaimed former Mason who was threatening to publish a book uh, revealing the secrets of the Masonic order was kidnapped from a sheriff station uh, in Batavia, New York and uh, disappeared Never to be seen again. Uh, the this local, is really uh, like 1820s QAnon, basically. Uh, uh, yes. In this case, and there's an actual crime here. Uh, yes. And not only did this happen, but local Freemasons in the government uh, and the legal professions played it down and said, uh, you know what? He probably just got drunk and ran away. And you know what? If someone killed him, he had it coming. Because why are you talking about the Vacansons, dude? Why are you talking about the Masons? And so in this area of the country, which is already being uh, socially destabilized by the rise of the uh, the merchant economy around uh, the canal, uh, which is being roused to religious fervor by the Third Great Awakening. Upstate the burned New York, over district. 
It's called the Burned Over District. It's also where uh, Joseph Smith has his revelations from the Angel Moroni. Uh, it's a hot political environment. And this fl- this tinder of the uh, the Morgan case creates this explosion of anti-Masonic sentiment. People start looking around and say there's this secret society that just so happens to contain many of the most uh, advanced members of our social strata, including the governor of New York, DeWitt Clinton, and President Andrew Jackson. And you see here the emergence of this northern um, politicized alienation from uh, the system, which couldn't be expressed through hostility to the banks the way the Democrats did because they lived in the shadow of the Erie Canal. Uh, the, their politics were uh, organized around finance in a way that made them sort of immune to that. They had to get their own boogeyman, and so they decided it was these godless, that was a big part of it, it was religiously inspired, these godless masons uh, who did not worship God but worshiped some strange other thing uh, that they won't talk about. Uh, and uh, so at bricks. first, this is just a explosion of social uh, uh, anxiety. Uh, but Thurlow Weed sees it as an opportunity to maybe get John Quincy Adams uh, uh, another term. So he uh, spreads, he sends an army of uh, political operatives into upstate New York to make political speeches, to organize uh, anti-Masonic feeling politically until they have created something called simply and to the pointly the anti-Masonic party, which at the grassroots is, is fired by this anxiety about who's really in control of this country. Uh, and then at the level of its political expression, controlled by these national Republicans uh, around weed who wanted a vehicle to get the increasingly unpopular John Quincy Adams elected president. Uh, it, and as part of this, Willard Fillmore, who at this time is a prominent lawyer in the area, is uh, rec- recruited to run for the state assembly as an anti-Mason. And while John Quincy Adams doesn't win New York, the Masons do, anti-Masons do sweep Western New York uh, and, and put Fillmore in the state assembly. They create an organization that extends throughout the uh, northern tier. It becomes the ruling party, I believe, in New Hampshire uh, and eventually sends Millard Fillmore to uh, Congress. Uh, and during his term in Congress, he spends his time doing the things that would end up defining the Whigs, pursuing tariffs in favor of uh, industry, uh, and also trying to find a more stable platform for the policies that him and Thurlow Weed and the other northern merchant-type political figures wanted to see enacted. Uh, because the Manti Mason Party very quickly showed that it had a limited capacity to uh, appeal beyond its sectional origins. Also, I imagine they were having a hard time actually doing anything about the Masons. They, well, that's the other thing. They couldn't really do anything about the Masons. Uh, many of the people that they ended up having to nominate were Masons uh, <laughs> because everybody at the high yeah, level of was politics Mason. was a Mason and they were their only options. And so pretty quickly, the whole thing started falling apart. And uh, Fillmore spends his time in Congress and then afterwards uh, helping form uh, in New York the political machinery of what would then become the Whig Party. And so he, uh, he becomes a Whig, becomes a prominent New York Whig, uh, eventually kind of falls out with Thurlow Weed, and uh, as Thurlow Weed finds uh, William Seward as his uh, political protege, uh, and then is, uh, runs for governor as a Whig unsuccessfully, uh, but is offered as the VP in 1848 as a olive branch to the clay faction after uh, Zachary Taylor is nominated over uh, a less slavery associated candidate, which is what a lot of the Whigs wanted. Uh, And so uh, Millard Fillmore's name was put in as a, as an olive branch to the North, even though uh, nobody really had any idea at that point, just how little Millard Fillmore actually cared about slavery as an issue from a moral <laughs> standpoint. 
And, you know, he wasn't going to be president. He was just going to be the vice president. So who cares? But Millard Fillmore became president on July 10th, 1850. He ascended in the middle of one of the fiercest periods of congressional debate in history. Uh, While he was presiding over the Senate as vice president, Mississippi Senator Henry Foote had pulled a fucking gun on Missouri's Thomas Hart Benton before the other senators separated them. Uh, One of the, uh, the, you know, top 10 uh, Senate world star moments. (laughs) Yes. As president and as always, uh, Fillmore sought compromise and resolution. Uh, he quickly moved to soften some of the administration's positions and work towards a solution uh, around the issues at hand, which were still the establishing of governments in the West and the issue of where slavery would expand. The result of all of this was the Compromise of 1850, a series of interrelated bills providing for the management of new territories and other issues. Uh, Fillmore's forceful campaigning in the Senate then became instrumental in pushing these compromises through. They established the border of Texas and established the New Mexico and Utah territories. Slightly later in the summer, California was admitted directly into the Union as a free state. They also prohibited the slave trade in the District of Columbia, but they strengthened the fugitive slave laws, allowing for the federal government to assist Southerners in apprehending slaves escaped to the North was a huge sticking point for Northerners. Though Fillmore personally objected to slavery, and I say objected there in the classical sense of, you know, Northern politicians in that he kind of didn't really give a shit, uh, he felt obligated to pursue the Fugitive Slave Act with maximum force. Uh, So there you go. Another can kick down the road. Uh, The Compromise of 1850 was lauded uh, by some, including Fillmore, as the savior of the Union. Uh, just like all these compromises were at the time. This is it, the final solution to our our slavery problem. Now we never have to talk about this again. Uh, But otherwise, it pissed off a lot of Northerners and Southerners alike. Fillmore was ambivalent about pursuing a second term in 1852 uh, and somewhat supported his aged friend Daniel Webster's attempt at the Whig nomination. But ultimately, the lack of decisive support for either threw the nomination to New Jersey's General Winfield Scott. They love the generals, folks. The handsome generals. He's big. He's strong. If, if the Whigs aren't going to nominate Henry Clay, you bet your ass it's going to be a guy with fucking uh, with scrambled eggs on his uh, sleeves. <laughs> but Millard Fillmore would be the last Whig president. Uh, and if you discount Lincoln's 1864 run on a National Union ticket, uh, the last president who is neither a Democrat or a Republican. So why is Fillmore interesting? Uh, well, one reason is where he ended up post-presidency, Matt. So Fillmore, whose entire goal during his term was to suppress the sectional crisis and and keep things, uh, keep the country together so that people could make keep making money so that America's commerce could continue its glorious march across the, the continent. And he thought that the Compromise of 1850 was a perfect uh, expression of that desire. But there were a lot of people in the North and more specifically people in northern Whig politics who did not agree, who found the compromise to be unacceptable, who demanded uh, a, a stronger line against slavery and were sp- particularly outraged by the uh, by the Fugitive Slave Act. And the thing that united these people is that they were out of power and as Fillmore saw it, they could afford to be maximalists on these questions because uh, they were not responsible for the na- na- national unity and, and the continuation of the Republic the way that Fillmore was. And in New York, for example, good old Thurlow Weed, who spent the first year of Taylor's uh, presidency shitting all over Fillmore and trying to have him <laughs> cut out of influence in the uh, cabinet only to see Taylor die and Fillmore become president. Uh, and therefore shut out of the top realms of power of the Republican Party in the state, uh, they see slavery as a p- winning political issue to press against the Fillmore faction. And there's actually a, uh, there's a split in the New York Whig Party between the conscience Whigs, or, which is what people like Seward call themselves, who, who, who insisted that they follow their conscience and oppose slavery, 
uh, and the compromise and the silver grays, <laughs> which were named uh, for the flowing gray locks of one of Fillmore's supporters who led the contingent to dramatically marched out of a convention. So uh, Fillmore out of out of office now seeing uh, the Whig party break into pieces over the question of slavery uh, is very keen on continuing his goal of creating a party that can represent Northern uh, capital interests without being a sectional party, because they all understood that a sectional party might win power, but it would do it at the cost of a confrontation with the South that they didn't want. So, the Republican Party, and we'll talk about this more next week, is in the process of being formed as an attempt to create a coherent anti-slavery politics that would be by definition sectional. Uh, guys like Fillmore are trying to figure out a way to have a political party that could marry northern interests economically uh, to a some sort of southern interests by excluding slavery as an issue. But the issue, the problem for them is, is that what do you get people in the streets with? What do you get people marching about? People care about slavery in a way that they don't care about the tariff. How are you going <laughs> to get them out there? And the answer that guys like Fillmore came along with was uh, anti-Catholic sentiment. <laughs> because during this period in the northern cities, uh, the Irish, the Catholic population, specifically the Irish Catholic population, is exploding in cities like Boston and New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and the local middle class the white the protestant middle class begins to react in horror to this this new cultural formation this callback to a in their minds more primitive communal european social order that they uh define themselves against they began to see catholicism as incompatible with american democracy and started creating their own secret societies uh, including one called the Order of the Star Spangled Banner, which was created in 1848. Uh, it was an organization that began in New York City and expanded throughout northern cities, and it was made up of the same type of people who had made up the Masons, the ascendant middle class. And they had their own handshakes. They had their own passwords. They had uh, degrees of uh, membership. Uh, and I, I like the idea of degrees of membership based on how much like proving different levels of hatred for Catholics. Yeah. Like, have you ever uh, kicked over a uh, have you kicked a leprechaun? That's a yes. degree one. <laughs> uh, no, the first. And, oh, and they also had uh, like organizations. The the the, uh, the sections were called wigwams. Mm. Uh, but the first degree of membership was someone who swore an oath to oppose any non-native for public office uh, and a second degree person could run for an office either within the organization or without of it. And outside of that process of candidate recruitment came the American party, which was known colloquially as the know nothings, which came from the fact that as, as a secret society, its members were uh, told to respond to any questions about the goings on in the group with, I know nothing. No, nothing. So very quickly, this political movement takes off the same way that the uh, the anti-Masons had, uh, only not here in more urban areas. Uh, and it's the same attempt by a a precarious and 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 uh, sort of threatened feeling middle class in the north to express their alienation uh, without challenging the, fu the fundamental nature of the system that they've endorsed. And that meant blaming, uh, unlike the Republicans who blamed the far enemy of slavery, the know-nothings blamed the near enemy of uh, urban Catholic immigrants. And it involved uh, demonstrations and, and even riots and, and, and the burnings of, of Catholic schools and things like that. It was a, it was a sort of a quasi-paramilitary political movement. And very quickly... People around Millard Fillmore identify this as the vehicle for uh, Fillmore's return to power and for the reassertion of a non-sectional, uh, industrially oriented party. Because the way they read the 
uh, people around Fillmore reasoned because everybody in the South was Protestant and, and fully uh, hostile to Catholicism outside of Louisiana, uh, that they could run there the same way that the old Whigs had. Uh, and the people who supported the old Whigs would be glad to support them because they weren't talking about slavery. Uh, they were essentially the, 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 the goal of these people at the political level was to go at the other go after the other head of the two heads of the democratic uh, coalition, not the Southern one that the Republicans were going at, but the Northern Catholic one. Uh, and so Fillmore who started his career running against the secret uh, behind the scenes antics and, and passwords and, and handshakes of the Masons uh, ends his career in politics running as the presidential party for the, uh, the know nothings in 1856 and the know nothings have significant success. They get members of Congress, they gain governorships, uh, but they uh, are unable to do very well at the national level. Fillmore only gets a uh, one state in his electoral column, that of Maryland <laughs> and the, the Democrat James Buchanan who sweeps the South uh, and wins some Northern States as well uh, becomes president but the real story is that the Republican Party, organized as a sectional party around opposition to slavery, sweeps most of the North, uh, indicating that that, will, that, that s sectional showdown is going to be the future of party politics in America. And that's really the story of the 1840s here is this breakdown of this second party formation in America in a kind of, you know, hilariously ramshackle way is we have these multiple instances of a party taking power uh, through either uh, death or, you know, otherwise accident being led by somebody who uh, fundamentally opposes central tenets of the party and then radically shifts the prerogatives of the party during their term in office, whether it's, you know, Polk remaking the Democrats as a pro expansionist party uh, or, you know, uh, uh, Fillmore or Tyler ending up at the head of a ticket of a party that, that, you know, didn't really intend them to be there. Uh, you know, you, you can sense these already unstable coalitions straining to uh, exist against the, the fundamental incoherence of, of their positions in regards to trying to create a national ideology around what is unavoidably in the end and increasingly loomingly sectional conflict. Yep. And uh, guys like uh, Fillmore are just the, they're the kid with the finger in the dike trying to figure out a way out of the, the fundamental, uh, the, the, the riddle that can't be solved. Uh, because while there was a strong nativist current in America, uh, it was confined geographically uh, and, it, and the politics of uh, immigration at that point uh, just could not compare to the passions involved by the politics of slavery. And so uh, when looking for a political expression of those uh, northern economic interests, the Republican Party just uh, absolutely swamped the know-nothings. And uh, Fillmore, of course, like most northerners, even those of southern sympathies, uh, supported the Union during the Civil War, uh, but was very critical of Lincoln's leadership uh, and supported uh Johnson's presidential reconstruction after the war. Just uh, one of those guys who, who blamed the whole thing on slaves more than anybody. The whole unpleasantness was really the slaves fault for existing and, uh, nor and unscrupulous Northern politicians for exploiting passions to get elected. That is really how he felt about the Republicans. We hate when those politicians exploit passions. Don't Disgusting. we? Disgusting. Keep those, keep your passions, your out passions of my politics. yourself. I'm over here being uh, the 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 handsomest man who's ever who's Queen Victoria ever saw. <laughs> Is that that's something a, you that's that the, was there's said? a quote that there's a apocryphal quote I guess that she said that Millard Fillmore is the handsomest man she ever saw. They actually kind of have similar face shapes. They're both kind yeah. of, uh, you know, like genial round faces. They got the round face for sure. Maybe maybe she just uh, has that kind of 19th century uh, European aristocrat attraction to like. You know, they're, they're all the uh, they're all marrying their cousins over there. Yep. Oh, they do be marrying their cousins. So there we go. That's Millard Fillmore. Uh, that's the 1840s in presidential politics. Now it's 1853 and we've had five presidents in 12 years. 
Of the three of them actually elected, they led rickety coalitions mostly galvanized around the singular issue that was increasingly consuming all others, the expansion of slavery. It forced them to reorient their parties around accommodating it and appeasing it, even if in their hearts and minds they sought to oppose it. It was a bileless ulcer bleeding into all other issues, filling up American political life like a giant lake of shit. Presidents was produced by me, Chris Wade, with our lovely co-producer Nick Quaz. Our theme music is by Nick Diamonds, with initial music by Young Chomsky. Our episode art is by Branson Reese. See you next week for a little thing uh, some of you might have heard of, Civil War. <laughs> Civil War much? And yeah, uh, th- there's no Iron Man. <laughs> exactly. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.